This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, it's a conversation with literature professor and psychotherapist Makita Brotman, author of The Solitary Vice Against Reading on the Marketplace of Ideas, cultural conversation of the depth you demand. It's the Marketplace of Ideas. I am your man of letters and sound waves, Colin Marshall, talking today to Makita Brotman, a literature professor, a cultural critic, and a psychotherapist whose writing has appeared in Film Quarterly, The Chronicle of Higher Education, Bad Subjects, Pop Matters, a whole bunch of places. Her newest book is The Solitary Vice Against Reading. Makita, welcome to the program. Thanks. It's great, great to be here. I had a... I had a food and wine writer on the show last year, I think, who wrote a book whose thesis was something like French cuisine and wine is in a little bit of a slump, and it has been for a while, but it's coming out of the slump. And to this book, the publisher applied the subtitle Food, Wine, and the End of France. And this struck me as as somewhat hyperbolic, but not not totally out of par for the publishing industry to, and I guess maybe mostly in North America, to apply a, a subtitle that may or may not be totally related to what's in the book, but has kind of a thrust to it. And I naturally couldn't ignore thinking about the subtitle of your own book, which uh, the subtitle is Against Reading. And I want to know, what was the process by which it acquired the subtitle Against Reading? Yeah, it's a good question. I I didn't want to call it against reading. Um, I'm certainly not against reading myself, and I don't think many people are. But, and, um, you know, ori- and I just wanted to call it The Solitary Vice. And originally, I wanted to write a book about me, myself, my own reading habits, my kind of interesting history with books and with reading experiences, which is kind of unusual, I think, but it's also not completely unique, and I thought that other people might uh, empathize with those experiences. But the publisher wanted something that was um, that would reach out to others and would be controversial and, you know, attract reviewers and make a bit of a fuss. And so um, I, I didn't mind having the subtitle because it's kind of a Trojan horse. I mean, it sort of gets people in and um, gets people involved in the book and it's controversial, and it's disturbing and shocking. But there's, the book's not against reading. It may be against certain kinds of reading and certain kinds of readers. So I think it worked to that extent. But the problem is, I, I mean, most people who read the book re- realize right from the start that this is not a book against reading. And in fact, I say that quite early on. This isn't a book against reading. That's that's just a, a ploy to get you in. <laughs> but there, are, there have been like one or two reviews um, where the reviewers have said they haven't even read the book, that have dismissed the book and said, how can there possibly be a book against reading? This is outrageous and ridiculous. So in a couple of cases, maybe it rebounded, but I think that in general, uh, the ploy obviously worked. Yes, it's uh, we're, we're a bit of a distance now from the release of the book, and you can say with some confidence that that was, that was actually a, a good business choice to have against reading be right there on the cover? Uh, yeah, I think so, especially especially for... Especially since a lot of most of the reviewers uh, read the book fairly closely and carefully, and were clear to acknowledge in their reviews and in writing about the book that this isn't uh, a book against reading at all. And in fact, you know, if you look at the quotes on the back and the bio, I'm a literature professor. You know, it seems pretty pretty clear that um, I'm not against reading. And in fact, the whole notion of a book against reading would seem sort of um, paradoxical and oxymoronic. So. Uh, so yes, I, I, I'd say so. Yes, I mean, from a business point of view, I think I think you're right. I think it worked. And I don't think that I don't think it's a bill of false goods or anything. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to be disappointed because they didn't get enough of a polemic against reading. Uh, I, I do think that it may be it maybe pitches the book as something less interesting than it is. Uh, which it's a bit like if you called if you called Heart of Darkness Heart of Darkness against boating in the Congo. Like it's <laughs> yeah, I guess. yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. But I think it's, I don't, you know, I don't know very much about this, but I think it's so hard to market books now that that are different or fall between the cracks or don't fit in a particular genre. Or, I think it always has been difficult to market books like that. But 
But now, I mean, it's, it's, even, it's difficult for people to even to take on books that don't look as though they're easily marketable. So it's really a, a, a book of personal essays about my reading experiences and my uh, interests in reading, and it goes in all kinds of different directions. And it's, it, So the Against Reading is like a kind of springboard from which the book sort of launches off and goes into all, all different kinds of directions. But if it gets people in, that's, that's okay, fine by me. Indeed. And if the book is legitimately against anything, what would you say it's against? I think if it's against anything, it's against um, sort of unthought assumptions that people tend to make about what reading is. Because the thing that, I mean, I start, start off in the book talking about my irritation with the notion these days that reading is simply a um, prima facie good thing and healthy and good for you and it's going to help you and encourage you and that and not just that but it's exciting and sexy and um and and also the knee-jerk reaction against all the other kinds of electronic devices that compete with books for people's attention like you know blackberries and iphones and this this sort of automatic assumption that that this this kind of apocalypse is occurring where nobody's reading anymore and that books are in danger because I think that's it's it's just um, it's too easy an assumption. It's not true. I see people reading everywhere. I just was on a flight back from Canada and walking down the aisle. You know, people may have been holding Kindles or laptops, but most of them were reading. And in fact, the majority of them were reading novels. They may have been airport novels, but they were still, you know, people were still absorbed in reading um, books. And I. I think there's too much um, anxiety about what's happening with reading and that people are reading less than they used to and what's going to happen to the book. I think there's, so if it's against anything, it's against that unthought, knee-jerk assumption. Because I think, it's, I think there's a lot of hidden elitism and superiority in that, in that assumption, too, that's not really carefully thought out and too easy to make. So if it's against anything, it's against that glib um, assumption that reading's on its way out. It is a point you make in the book, and I've heard you make elsewhere, and that people often talk about is that there is a lot of hand-wringing about the supposed death of reading. There was that that NEA report not too long ago that I believe you talked about in the book, Reading at Risk, and yes. there's all the factors, there's all the, the numbers people bring out saying, oh, the average North American adult reads uh, 23% of a book a year, things like that. And you can demonstrate that people are reading things. You know, they may be reading it on the internet, they may be reading a Kindle, they're reading something else, but they're not generally not reading. Which leads me to what I guess is the obvious question that the people who are the people who are complaining and who are doing the hand wringing about reading dying, I don't know they're not making it up out of whole cloth, but maybe they're not sure what they're actually complaining about. I mean what what is the actual fire to which they are breathing in so much smoke, supposedly? I mean it's it's not the death of reading, but what is it? Yeah, and I mean maybe it's um cri- different kinds of crises in the publishing industry, the the fact that um fewer and fewer things are being published that are recognizable from their childhood as books. Or the idea that people have a different kind of literacy now that um, that young people begin to read on perhaps computer screens or and don't read the same kind of way that people used to read in the past. They don't absorb themselves in, in three-volume novels. Um, but I think it's, it's an anxiety that's um, more about kind of... Um, what people see as changes in the culture. But I think it's on a par with all the other kinds of anxieties about changing the changes in a culture, which, um, I, and I guess if, an, if you look around you, you might see all kinds of changes that are very different from, uh, and that life seems very different from the life that you lived as a child. But in fact, on a world scale, people's lives are basically the same as they've always been. You know, the majority of people in the world wake up in the morning and go and, harvest the grain or milk the cow and um, try and eke out a living. And so we're really talking about a kind of pretty small proportion of the world, which is the Western world. And, um, you know, there's still an enormous amount of illiteracy in the world, as there always has been, but it's to do with inadequacies in in education in, in the third world, not because people are 
playing with their Kindle and computer games. So on a world scale, I don't think things are changing that much. It's just that the world may not be as familiar to us as the world of our childhood, and that creates all kinds of apocalyptic fears and, and anxieties. But um, I think that it's kind of um, a sort of very Western elitist concept that everything's going to the dogs. So could we maybe say then because because Western or developed world opinion leaders aren't seeing a world like the one they grew up in, that becomes a this, this sort of flag being waved for a crisis? Yes, and then various the collapse of various newspapers and big changes in the publishing industry and the fact that, that students are unfamiliar or um, school children are unfamiliar with great works of literature. These are held up as watermarks that suggest the world's in this terrible crisis and everything's um, nothing's going to be the same as it was. And yet, really, these are just, I think, tiny, um, tiny differences. And on a on a on a world scale, things things are the same as as they ever were. Last night, I went to a reading by Gary Steingart. Um, he was reading from his new book. I don't know if you've uh, read it. It's called Super Sad True Love Story. It's right. set in a a future world, not very far in the future, maybe 10, 20 years in the future, where um, people, don't, people no longer read, and the protagonist is a, a reader who... Um, reading is seen as something that, he, that you do in private, like masturbation, and it's kind of embarrassing, and nobody should... And, and you know, people are, are embarrassed to be caught doing it. And, um, and I gave this, um, an extract from this text to my students um, in, a, in a, a writing class, and they... They were all horrified by the idea of a world without books or a world that doesn't value reading. But when I asked them about other details in the story, they were happy to say, oh, I skipped over that. That was just too difficult. I didn't read all that. I only read the email entries. Or So there's, there's, there's a kind of cognitive dissonance between um, the, this horror of the idea of a world without books, and yet they, they didn't seem to realize that what they were doing <laughs> was, uh, was um, you know, um, reading in a very frivolous and trivial way. This idea of people sort of preemptively missing a world of books and reading who aren't really engaging with books and reading the way they've traditionally been conceived here in these types of discussions. It seems like this is too obvious, a contradiction for them to miss, but it happens quite a bit. So I guess what I wonder is why, I mean, why, why would they think that way? I mean, surely you've done plenty of thinking about this. What's what leads someone to to have this very this very this almost desperation about reading going away, and yet be an active agent in the going away of reading? You know, it's a, it's a, an interesting notion. I think that certain kinds of cognitive dissonance like that are built into the culture we live in because we just you know everything is so fragmented and compartmentalized, and we don't see. Um, the origins of things, and so uh, you know, I'm a, a vegetarian, and it's kind of horrifying for me to see to go and see the movie Babe and see people um, happily eating hot dogs while weeping at the fate of Babe on the screen, yeah. without there being any kind of you know sense of disparity there. And um, and I think the same with um, with books. I think there's a kind of fetishizing of the book as an object, and people will go into long reveries about the smell of books and the feel of books and the texture of books um, and, uh, and yet um, don't, see, don't see that as having any connection somehow with the fact that they um, will be very dismissive of writing that they don't understand or that they don't particularly um, want to get engaged in. Um, for example, I'm, I'm using with these students um, a, a, an, a, the a volume of the best American short stories. It's a volume edited by Updike, best American short stories of the 20th century. And some of my 18-year-old students were very dis- dismissive of these stories and say, this is a novice story, or um, I-, I-, I couldn't really get involved in this story because um, the author doesn't know how to create character and, um, and have no kind, of, um, no kind of problem with very entitled judgments about these stories that have been voted by Updike in the New York at the best of the 20th century, yet um, are so used to kind of privileging their own opinions that 
don't um, don't question them, and they have every right to skip over a part that they find is boring or um, incompletely conceived without having a sense that the failure is in themselves as readers rather than the author as a writer. How distinct is that from the reading you were doing, say, in some of the most intense reading periods you talk about in your book growing up, or even when studying literature in, in higher education later on? Did you... Did you not feel any of that? And did you not feel like you were able to skip or to skim or to judge because, because there was this sort of, these, these stories, these texts were, were sort of set up before you and thus it's, it's on you to, uh, to come to them? No, I think I, w- I had my own kind of entitled a sense of judgment, um, just like my students do now. But for me, it was very different because... What I wanted in a book, and to a certain extent what I want in a book now, although to a different degree, is to escape. And what I wanted from my book was a story that completely took me out of the world that I was living in, um, that I could get so absorbed in that I forgot where I was and who I was and the time and place and circumstances in which I was I was living. And I think that a lot of people now, my students, for example, what they look for in a book is a character and a setting that they can relate to, a circumstance that they can relate to. So if something is set in the future or if it's set in another country or if it's characters that I'm familiar with, that will be immediately off-putting. Whereas for me, that was that was what drew me to a book. And I was most um, compelled by Gothic novels, which were, you know, I wanted I wanted it to be set in a world that was recognizable. So I was never interested in science fiction, for example, but it had to be my world, but at seven or eight removes. So the, to a certain extent, the older, the better, the more, the spookier and more unusual, the characters, the better. I liked dark, scary novels with um, eerie monks set in haunted castles with (laughs) skeletons and ghosts and haunted families from the past, and, you know, um, the, the more distant it was from my own quotidian circumstances, the more exciting and appealing it was for me. And I, and so, yes, I was pretty judgmental about contemporary novels, not because I thought they were necessarily badly written or, or there was anything wrong with them in, in, in the sense of quality, but that's not what I was looking for. You know, I had... I was sick of daily reality. I had enough of that. I didn't want more of it. And so what I wanted from my art was something else. I wanted it to take me out of myself and out of my daily daily routine and daily daily circumstances. And the, the thing that did that um, most efficiently for me was horror. So I've always been interested in horror, both in uh, fiction, literature, and also in, in films. So yes, you know, I had I have my own... Um, idiosyncratic and bizarre and unusual tastes and you know partly that's what the the book is about in the book we have two versions of you we have the the teenager that you've sort of just been describing who is up in the attic buried in the castle of otranto or, or what have you for hours and days and weeks on end as a means of escaping and then we have the the version of you writing this book the current one who's asking a lot of questions about you know what what's the value of spending a lot of time in a lot of time spent in novels, you know, um, new or old or, or or whatever. What was what was the process there? I mean, was there a point where it dawned on you maybe maybe you weren't getting a lot from novels beyond a kind of opiate, or what happened there to change your mind? It's hard to know when that process of realization came. I think it was something on, ongoing and and gradual, but. Uh, I, and I, I don't think it. Ha- I mean, I don't think people read too much very often. And I'm sure that the main problem with children is they're not reading enough. But just like, you know, when you run a marathon, people are told to drink, drink lots and lots of water. There are one or two people who drink too much water. <laughs> it's something as as um, something very similar. You know, it's good to read. Children are encouraged to read, but there are occasional children who read too much, and looking back, I realized that I overvalued reading at the expense of real life, and it would have been, I think, much better for me just in terms of like my social development and 
you know, my emotional development, perhaps also my intellectual development, to spend at least one evening a week, if not more, actually going out of the house, um, hanging out with friends, you know, engaging, having boyfriends, engaging in kind of normal adolescent development. And um, the more I read, the more disillusioned I became with real life. So the more exciting the worlds that I read about, the more disenchanted I was with the world around me. So it was kind of a self-perpetuating problem, a, a vicious cycle. The more I read, um, the less I wanted to be um, in the world outside of books. Maybe in the last 10 years, when I've, I have a much more of a balanced life where I have a kind of life in the physical world that's very active and I have lots of friends and I have you know, concrete, real things around me that I do and that I'm involved in, I realize like, how, how many pleasures the real world has to offer that I dismissed or underestimated as a child. And I think any kind of art form, whether it be books or music or uh, literature or film, can be an escape. And sometimes that escape can, can become pathological and... Um, the the person who's using the art form needs it for a crutch and isn't able to function without it and I, I think that's kind of what happened um what happened to me. I don't think it's a I don't think it's common, but I think it it can happen. And here and now there's kind of a there's kind of a prevalence that shall we say geek subculture ha- has gained and that if somebody's very into something and somebody does one specific thing a lot they just are labeled or label themselves a geek of that thing and they they gain a certain amount of acceptance or even a kind of admiration for their dedication if, if i met a girl like you describe yourself as being um in your teenage years today who was always reading these gothic novels you know she'd probably call herself a gothic novel geek or what have you and that, <laughs> yeah. that would be her thing and people would wouldn't necessarily look down on her for it because that's you know we all we all these days have our, our spheres of geekery, but I take it in the context of mid nineteen eighties England, it wasn't this way. Yeah, I mean, partly the you know the internet has caused that difference. There was no internet, there was no Facebook, there were no communities of like minded um, girls in their attic bedrooms. If I'd had Facebook or the internet back then, I might have at least online found myself a community where I could talk with other antisocial sulky girls in attic bedrooms about the gothic novels we were reading. And I think that would at least have been some form of connection and, and, and community. And also, as you say, a sense of kind of identity formation of like, this is, um, you know, I'm not just a dropout and a loser. I have chosen gothic geekdom as my form of identity and I'm proud of it. But, you know, at least um, when, I, when, I was, when I was younger, yes, it was seen as kind of it was certainly frowned upon and seen as really taboo and a mark of, of being a loser if you were completely involved with one particular thing at the expense of others. But within reason, um, if you were involved with your children at the expense of everything else, that's perfectly healthy and acceptable. You know, if you're involved with your family or, or if you're involved with sport, following a football team or playing in a football team, or, you know, there are certain things that you can be obsessed with without being stamped as a a geek. So it did seem kind of unfair to me that, you know, it's taboo to be obsessed with gothic novels, but if I had been obsessed with, you know, pop music or getting engaged or, you know, something that was more socially acceptable, that would have been okay. And I think, you know, there's there's still something to be said about that today. I mean, it's perfectly fine to uh, talk endlessly about your, your children or your mortgage, but not about, you know, has this construction of sentences, something like that. Yeah, there there still is certainly in the public sphere a little bit of the encouragement of one thing and discouragement of the other in that yeah. sense. But when you say talk to students, is this something you see like a divide between the people who, or the, between the, the students who would be called literature geeks and the ones who are geeks of something else and therefore kind of exempt themselves from what they're maybe supposed to be studying? It's hard to say now. You know, I teach at an art college and I work with art students, so they're all, they're all, I mean, they're mainly introverted and geeky in their own, everyone is geeky in his or her own way, but um, it's so much more acceptable 
when you're at an art college to be a geek of some kind or another. You know, this is like a haven for geeks. So the people who are stigmatized are the, the cheerleaders and the, um, and the, 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 the jocks. So it's kind of the, the, the other way around. The more people I know and the more I think about people and the way that their minds work and the more I learn about people, it's very, it's very, you know, I think that we are all geeks in one form or another. You know, the, the further you penetrate into the layers of the human mind, the more you find that we all have our obsessions and, and compulsions and that's what forms our unique identities. So, you know, some of them are socially stigmatized and some of them are not, but um, I think that's just the way the human mind works. I mean, we're all we're all kind of separated from each other, but also compelled to find connections. And it's a kind of push and pull. Um, at the same time, we're drawn to each other and we're repelled by each other. And I think the way I see it now is that's just human identity. That's just the way that culture works and um, and the way that the way humanity manifests itself. So it's something, I I see it in a more kind of existential light now and I'm far more forgiving. I think that finding connections, as you put it, it seems to be a big theme in discussions, in certain discussions about reading. And it comes up in your book in terms of not being able to make a lot of human connections because of spending so much time alone, reading, engaging in this solitary vice. But I also hear it brought up as a defense of novels and a defense of long novels and a defense of social novels and of reading. It was, it's something Jonathan Franzen writes a lot about, and he's not an author I've read much of, but I have read these articles of his where he talks about, he talks about giving himself permission to write the novels he writes because they are, they're ways of diminishing loneliness and ways of, and ways of helping people become helping readers become more able to get connected to others because because of giving them a window into the mind of fictional characters and i'm not sure where to come down on that whether it sounds plausible or implausible but what do you think about the defense of the defensive novels as as agents of helping us human connection rather than hindering it yeah it's very interesting and um i've read this Essays by Franz and where he talks about it, and also I think it's something that David Foster Wallace talks about too in in some of in some of his essays, and um, I think David Lipsky talks about it. I mean, I've yeah. I've really thought about it. And it's it's hard. It's a very difficult question to answer because I do, when reading a novel or even an essay, sometimes feel this intense fascination with the authorial voice and a real. I feel a real kind of deep connection with the author and an engagement with the author and feel that this is a consciousness speaking to my consciousness in this very chaotic and fragmented world. And this is a very profound and deep way that one human being can know another human being. And it seems to have something authentic and genuine about it. But then in circumstances where I've actually met an author that I've felt that way about, it often, it, you know, there's this terribly disconcerting disparity between the authorial voice and then the flesh and blood figure of the author. And sometimes, um, perhaps even often, it's a disappointment to meet the authors because in the flesh they can often be very standoffish or um, disconcerting. And, you you, you know, I've, I've had this experience so many times where I feel, can this really be the person that wrote that? <laughs> and then the question for me is, is one more genuine than the other? Is the authorial voice, you know, the the real self, or is that um, a kind of persona that's put on for writing? And I think in the book I write about how one of my favorite novels that took me a long time to get into is Conrad's Heart of Darkness, which you mentioned before. And I think what really draws me to the authorial voice of that novel and of the narrator Marlow is his notion of total aloneness, the aloneness of the human mind. <laughs> and one of the conclusions that Molo comes to as he's telling the story is, we live as we dream, alone. The deep connection that's made between me as a reader and the voice speaking to me as an author is uh, the revelation that we cannot connect, <laughs> you know, that we're essentially completely separate and alone, and that 
this breach of consciousness between two separate minds cannot be bridged. So it's a communication at the profoundest level, but the, um, the lesson of the communication is that communication is impossible. So it's a, it's a fascinating paradox. <laughs> If you've just tuned in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas, cultural conversation of the depth you demand. I'm Colin Marshall, and my guest is Makita Brotman, literature professor, psychotherapist, and author of The Solitary Vice Against Reading. If you have any questions, comments, anything like that, feedback, positive, negative, neutral, what have you, send it along without hesitation to Colin, C-O-L-I-N, at ColinMarshallRadio.com. It's Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. I'll read it. I'll pretty much certainly respond as well. If you want to hear this show again or any other in the Marketplace of Ideas interview history, visit ColinMarshallRadio.com for the website, the official website, featuring as well the Marketplace of Ideas archive. You can also download episodes on iTunes. Just open up iTunes, go to the iTunes store, and search for the Marketplace of Ideas. They're all available there as well. Now back to the conversation with Makita Brotman on the Marketplace of Ideas. Cultural conversation of the depth you demand. So I take it the sort of the sort of connection that you find in the best examples of these books that's that engage the author's consciousness with yours. There's there's no real equivalent of that outside of, of literature for you, or is there? There is. You know, I I I get that connection too from films and from music and from certain kinds of art. Because the musical note has no, it doesn't represent anything beyond itself, and because a color or a shape doesn't represent anything beyond itself, um, there's less of a direct connection. I mean, I'm never sure when I hear a piece of music or I look at a, a painting that I'm really engaged by, whether my engagement and my what fascinates me and what draws me in is something that the piece itself is communicating to me or whether it's something that I alone am finding in it, and it's a, my um, my engagement with it is a product of the uh, idiosyncrasies of my own mind and, and my own personal associations with this kind of tone or this kind of shape or this kind of color. And, um, and I guess to a certain extent it doesn't matter with music or, or with art, but if what one wants from from literature is a, a sense of connection and engagement with another voice, then it really does matter. Um, so I think literature is a place that people go to look for that kind of connection and expect to find that kind of connection. Uh, so it, I think it's just it's just more difficult to say in in the other arts whether or not it's it's simply personal and idiosyncratic, or whether one is actually reading something that's that's been you know that's communicated deliberately communicated by the composer or the director and given that it's it's not it's not fiction it's not that type of literature that you've chosen to communicate to your own audience with i mean the, the solitary vice is is i guess what i would call a form of autobiographical cultural criticism what type of connection i mean do you hope to achieve with with this form of text as opposed to the connection that can be achieved with fiction and you know literary fiction when I when I write, I I don't really think about connecting with, with a reader, and you know maybe <laughs> maybe I should think about that more. But I, I feel, as I suggest in this book, that I have a rather unusual and um, way of looking at the world, and I have always felt myself rather an outsider, and not an outsider in the way that you know. David Foster Wallace or Jonathan Franzen might might feel that they're an outsider, but something even um, an outsider even among outsiders. So, in writing, what I'm trying to do is to to shape um, to shape my own ideas and to give them a voice and a tone and to communicate them to myself, really. And you know, originally when I when I wrote the book, I it was a lot. I, I used the first person a lot more. I mean, it's still very first person, but um, in a second or third revision, I changed a lot of the eyes to use because I wanted to try. I mean, I felt that perhaps there would be people who felt the same way, 
And by taking it out of the first person and putting it more in the second person, I would make my experiences seem a little bit more universal and perhaps um, connect with other people who'd had those experiences. But I don't know if that was successful or not, because um, the book did get generally good reviews, but one of the not-so-good reviews was by Jessica Crispin, who I know you've had on the show in Bookslet, and she felt that that, that was a, a failure of the book. By, by using the second person, I was universalizing my own experience, whereas, in fact, my own experience was very particular and individual and idiosyncratic and didn't apply to other people. So that was something off-putting, that I made the assumption that everyone was like me. So I saw it as me reaching out, trying to say, hey, maybe, maybe you feel like this too. Have you ever had this experience? And it was interpreted as me universalizing a very personal and particular experience. And I can see how that, you know, how that might have come across. I mean, I know that I don't like to be addressed by an authorial voice that makes certain assumptions about me. Like when I read the, I don't read newspapers very often, but if I read the, you know, uh, uh, the New York Times as a kind of editorializing tone that assumes that everyone's worldview is that of the, the, the New York Times, and it's very off-putting to me. So I don't like to be sort of automatically embraced by someone else's worldview. Um, so, you know, maybe that was a flaw of the book. Well, I think about the parts of your book that that are farthest away, I guess, from my own sensibilities, if, yeah. if that's a way to put it. And I don't know if that's even a good way to put it, but I think of the, the chapters on, you, you mount a defense of certain types of marginalized, shall we say, reading, such as celebrity tell-alls and, yeah. um, and true crime novels. I don't really have an opinion on those books one way or the other, but at the same time, I, I knew starting those chapters, I probably wasn't going to immediately put down your book and pick up a, yeah. a true crime novel. Just, I, I don't know, I don't know why, but it just made me my maybe I like something even worse than those two things. And thus, uh, thus I would yeah, go to yeah, that. So, yeah. But uh, in in that sense, I mean, it wasn't as if reading it, I said to myself, oh God, she's assuming that I'm going to be convinced to read a celebrity confessional. It, it, not really. I mean, I was, I was interested in that example to see to see a defense of something that I wouldn't normally even read a defense of, much less think about reading. Um, and that's... Is that is that a way when you read something yourself that is sort of different from you? You approach it. It's more like, it's more like seeing an example of something different from you and being interested by it than than feeling as if you're having assumptions made about you. If that makes any sense. Yeah, I didn't. I, I mean, I I didn't think that I. In those chapters, I'm trying to convince people to pick up this book or to give this book a try. It's, that's not really what I was trying to do, and I don't think that anyone who has no taste for true crime is going to turn to true crime after reading my chapter on it. What I'm more interested is in tracing my own, like the different kinds, different varieties of engagement that I have. And it's interesting to me as a literature professor that I can be as engaged by Tolstoy as I am by, you know, a book about serial killers or a celebrity confessional. Like, what is it? I mean, those, those, those kinds of books usually have very different audiences and they're marketed to very different kinds of people. So what is it about my, what am I looking for in a book that I find both in Tolstoy and in, you know, Hollywood Babylon? And, I, and it's a way of, for me to learn more about myself and the way that my mind works and the things that I find really compelling and, and interesting, which are not always to do with literary style, I think they had to do with learning about other people's failures and details of other people's lives. You know, there, there are certain details of everyday life that can be found in both Tolstoy and Hollywood Babylon. So it's, it's me learning more about what I need in a book and what draws me into a book and what engages me, and then sort of working through that and exposing it, exposing my, the way that my mind works as I read, and um, hopefully suggesting that other people might find that interesting too, and they might be able to think about their own, um, what they look for in books. But I don't think I'm trying to convince people. I, the thing that I am suggesting is that 
that there shouldn't be any sense of like guilt or defensiveness that um that there are things to be found in um the kinds of literature that are usually dismissed that there are really interesting things to be found in those in those kinds of in those works um so i'm 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 suggesting that people shouldn't have a sense of you know that it's okay to read this kind of book but not okay to read this kind of book and i'm attacking i guess the sort of social convention that that is very dismissive about one kind of writing and not another kind of writing because i think they all have their you know there's certain talents to um to to all of them so that i think that's what i'm really doing in those chapters rather than trying to persuade people to to pick up a true crime novel for example i do periodically hear pretty interesting things from people in all in all forms of, of media, they'll say, you know, whatever they work with, they'll, they'll give similar sentiments to the one you just did. They'll say, yeah. well, I happen to be interested in this, this example that's called high, you know, their equivalent of the war and peace. And then yeah. this stuff that's called low as well, their equivalent of the Hollywood Babylon. And there's, with, that, with that comes a sort of rejection of the ideas of guilty pleasures and the ideas of high and low. Do you reject high and low? I mean, I know. I mean, they exist as cultural categories, and they exist for various reasons. But I, yes, I think it's not. You know, I, it's not that high and low. I I reject, but I reject the kind of assumptions that go with them. Yes, there are certain kinds of reading, for example, that that you kind of have to work up to, and you have to build up to. Someone was asking me last night whether I enjoy reading theory the same way that I enjoy reading reading modern fiction, and. I enjoy them both, but not in the same way. Just like it's easy to enjoy chocolate, but you have to work up a different kind of appetite to enjoy anchovies. It's just that you, you know you have to get involved in a different kind of system of taste sensations. And I, I hated olives as a, as a kid. Now I like olives, but it's a sort of gradual process of having um, different kinds of tastes and getting getting used to them and understanding the subtleties and complexities of them. So um, there are certain things that are more accessible and certain things that are less accessible, but I, I think that the social stigma and taboo associated with them um, are misplaced. And, and I think that a lot of so-called high culture is fetishized simply for the reasons that, are more, that have more to do with elitism and nostalgia and um, personal privilege rather than what's actually accessed in the form itself. I mean, my, my boyfriend has just left, he's going to see Dash Rheingold in, in, um, at Lincoln Center, and I didn't want to go with him, and I, because I know that, you know, I would have sat through the opera and had some good things to say about it, but I simply, I simply wouldn't have really enjoyed it the way that I'm going to enjoy whatever I do at home tonight, and it's, um, it's you know, I don't feel any, there should be any stigma about that because I simply haven't built up to that level of understanding of opera. And maybe I will, maybe I won't. And whether you're talking about sort of the accessible or the inaccessible or what people call the high or the low, and specifically in regard to books, you know, whether they're, whether they're true crime novels or whether they're celebrity confessionals or whether they are war and peace and heart of darkness. I mean, I don't see, I don't see fewer books around than I ever have. And I'm not necessarily sure I see fewer people reading, or I don't know if I saw that many in the first place, I guess. But the point is, with all the talk about books going away and publishing destroying itself and whatnot, I mean, I'm just, I'm just not seeing... I'm not seeing fewer books around. Do you do you find the same? I agree. I, I think, in fact, I, I refer to some statistics in my book that there are far there are more books being published now than there ever have been, just just by virtue of you know self publishing and desktop publishing and various the opportunities for people to publish themselves and various small presses and so you know whether or not people are reading uh, fewer books or reading differently is is not really a concern for me. I mean, there, there are always going to be plenty of books around. It's, it's actually difficult for me to, to live without books, and I'm always surrounded by books, even when I try and get rid of them and try very hard to get rid of them. They, they sort of keep reappearing, and I, don't, I, I feel like, as you were saying before, people's anxiety about books is, I think it's, it's misplaced. It's really an anxiety about something else, something that's going on in their life or their world, which is unfamiliar and frightening. But I don't think it's about books. I think 
books will always be with us, um, for better or worse. The more anxiety there is about about books disappearing, the more um, perhaps unfairly fetishized the actual physical form of the book becomes when, in fact, most reading now is probably not done with a traditional book. It's done on a screen. Um, but I think people are still reading. People are still fascinated by the written word. And people talk as much about about books, um, perhaps more than they ever have done. I mean, you know, listening to your podcast and various other podcasts where authors are being interviewed, I hear far more talk about books and ideas and publishing, I, I feel, than I have at any other time in my life. So it certainly doesn't seem to be anything that's on its way out or, or going away. You just simply have to kind of find the right, right venues. And it does seem like, or at least if I'm being optimistic, it, it seems like, with all of the e-books and the e-readers and the online versions of books and, and what have you that, that some traditionalists complain about being the death knell for the, the printed book they like so much. You know, we talk about we talk about the fetishists of the physical object of the book. It seems to me it could also it could go the other way. It could be this could be a time starting that is one of the better times for the physical book fetishists because the books that aren't really, that aren't meant to be solid and aren't meant to be sort of art objects in and of themselves can be PDFs or can be e-reader files. And the, the books that are actually printed can maybe, in a sense, go back to being the, the not necessarily heavier as in more pages, but the sort of more solid volumes that uh, maybe people remember from their childhood. Is that, is that something you ever think might happen? Yeah, I haven't thought about that, but it's, you know, I know um, people who are kind of, who are very interested in setting up their own, I mean, there's a, a book arts um, division at the college where I teach, and people are getting very interested in resurfacing different kinds of fonts that have disappeared and playing around with different textures for the jacket and um, and having illustrations within the, the, so I think, you know, you're right that the, the book as an art object is, is is perhaps coming very separate from the contents of the book, and you know that that might be a good thing. That might be just different kinds of different kinds of reading going on. And I want to come back also to specifically to where we began: literary fiction, the type of stuff that is talked about as being the panacea, but may not be. Toward the end of your book, you you bring up the very well known quote by Kafka that a book must. Uh, be the axe for the frozen sea within us, I believe. And you talk about this as hinting at what, for all the things people say literary fiction can do, this might point toward the actual thing it can do. And, and how do you think about that? I think that, you know, that quote from Kafka is, is one of my favorite quotes. And it really is a great counterbalance, I think, to all these campaigns about reading is Fun, fundamental and reading is sexy and reading is <laughs> enjoyable because, you know, the books that um, matter the most to me and have mattered the most to me in my life have not been enjoyable and they've certainly not been fun. I mean, a book, a book that really, books that can really make an impact, in my experience, are books that are disturbing and painful and disillusioning, you know, that disillusion one um, as to what it means to be human and to live in a human body and, and to live in the world. So um, the idea that reading helps and, and reading educates and changes your life for the better, I think is a very modern idea. And again, it is a little misplaced. Um, I don't think that's what reading should do. I don't think reading should necessarily bring pleasure in the sense that, um, in, in, in the sense that it, it's, it's often widely credited. I think that reading should do other things. It should maybe not necessarily form bonds of communication, but reinforce isolation, tell certain truths about the human condition that can't be told in any other form. And, um, and that, yeah, that to me is what books can do that other forms of, of, um, of art can't do. And, and, and that's, I think that's why something fundamentally in me rebels against this idea that reading is um, is this kind of you know universal panacea because it's there are certain things that reading can do and they're incredibly important fundamental things but 
Um, giving you fun is not one of them. <laughs> Um, not too long ago on this show, I was talking to a writer who wrote a book about his sort of dissatisfactions with with fiction and literature today, and we I, we discussed. I was ta- I was bringing up an idea about. I, I think I proposed to him that there are two kinds of novels. One of which turns you toward life and makes you take a long, hard look at it, and the other kind being um, essentially distractions or opiates. And this author proceeded to inform me that there's, in fact, a Samuel Johnson quote saying almost exactly that. So the, this idea that, that a work of literature can, it can turn you toward life or it can turn you away from it, the former being, I would argue, more valuable than the latter, which can actually be harmful. Is that an idea that resonates with you? Yeah, it, th- this is- I can't remember the guy's name. He's the guy who did the alternative history of the novel. Uh, it was it was David Shields. Uh, Reality Hunger was his. Book. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, right. It does resonate with me, but I think it's I think it's a lot more complicated than that because I think it, I think it's really about the individual and you know that novels the, <laughs> the Kafka quote. I mean, to me, I there's a I, I think it, it's too easy to talk about turning on and turning off in that way because there's something that's very pleasant for me. In being disturbed, and it's a, it sounds very paradoxical, but something that disturbs me or shakes my reality or turns me off the world is actually sort of <laughs> life affirming. So, in in my case, it's uh, it's a little bit a little bit screwier than that, and I, I think it all depends on the individ, on the idiosyncrasies of the individual reader. Um, I mean, I can. Enjoy life more in the company of books which turn me against life is 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 a very interesting paradox to me and and I think it's a by virtue of thinking about that paradox, I realize that it's not really an easy question to answer and and you know maybe maybe there is no answer. I think there are all different kinds of books there are as many different kinds of books as there are different kinds of readers um I like trying to think about things in general terms, but it always comes down to the responses of the individual. And so to me, I I have to say it's it's rather more complex. Do you think that's something that often gets forgotten when people write or think about reading in general, the responses of the individual? I think we have to forget it in a sense. We have to kind of make a... I think that we have to assume that most people do, as you said before, share certain sensibilities of ours and that we're speaking to other human beings who have, you know, who have similar kinds of consciousnesses and who do share our, our sensibilities. And I think that we have to live that way too. You know, we have to kind of make the assumption that other people have an inner life that is something like ours and that they suffer in the same way that we do and, they, and their pleasures are similar to ours. I mean, it's simply how we have to live our lives. And, and when we get to know people, you know, we, we realize then that, Actually, everyone's inner life is enormously complex, and you know there may be masochists who get pleasure from pain and um, all kinds of subtleties and complexities going on that that suggest that um, inner lives are, are far more multi layered and, and complex than we assume that we are, but we have to assume that people um, think about the world the same way that we do. The name of the book once again is the Solitary Vice against reading Makita, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the program thanks it's great. I really enjoyed it. If you'd like to find out more about Makita Brotman and the Solitary Vice, visit Makita Brotman, M-I-K-I-T-A-B-R-O-T-T-M-A-N dot com. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. If you want to hear this show again or any other interview we've done, visit ColinMarshallRadio.com for the official Marketplace of Ideas website and, of course, the complete interview archive. You can find that on iTunes as well. Open up iTunes, go to the iTunes store, search for the Marketplace of Ideas, and you'll find it pretty much immediately. The website of Ben Althaus, the man who makes our theme music, is available at benalthaus.com as well, so you can check that out too. And if you have any feedback, questions, comments, positive, negative, neutral feedback, suggestions about who you want to hear on this show, email it to Colin, C-O-L-I-N, that's me, at colinmarshallradio.com, C-O-L-I-N, Colin, at colinmarshallradio.com. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. We'll catch you next time on the Marketplace of Ideas, cultural conversation at the depth you demand.